get started. The first thing is, again, I want to introduce myself. My name is Paige Meyer, and I am the director of early learning in the Prince School District. And I used to be um, the principal of the Head to Elementary School. Um, Alice is my partner over here. She's passing out raffle tickets for prizes. She is our coordinator of early learning. Um, and we have um, Agda, who is our board member, right here, school board member Agda, was greeting everybody. And um, a, we have a great agenda for you tonight. So I want to thank you for taking time out of your very busy life to be here. We have so much exciting stuff for you. Um, we have Devon right over here, who is going to present on Brew, which is an amazing resource that is free for you and your families. If you have a smartphone, you can use it. Pretty much everybody does. After her, but not everyone, but many people do. After her, Annette, the big doctor, Annette Venegas, will be presenting on inquiry science in the preschool classroom. She has some content, and then she's going to have you do all kinds of hands-on activities that you can take directly back to your child care or preschool and do. We're going to close with child care resources. Adrian Wingo is going to come and talk a little bit about Early Achievers, which is our quality reading system for child care and preschool. Welcome, by the way. Yes. And then we have, Alice will do a little closure with you and ask for some feedback, and we're going to share the dates and topics of our sessions for next year. And those content, the content on those date, the, for those dates came from feedback from participants of these classes that we've had so far this year. So we hope you're excited about them. You do get Merit Stars credit for tonight if you signed in and you gave us your star credit. Okay. Mm -hmm. For those of you that attended last month, I did see I did the roster, uh, not last month, March, and we have certificates for you. They will be on the table, you can grab them on the way out. Okay? Um, we have certificates for you as well. Um, let's see, we have more people flowing in. Hi, great. So any other questions? If not, Feel free to pull, pull more chairs, crowd around. We can just cluster. We are going to get started. Okay? Thank you very much. Devon. All right. Good afternoon. Good evening. Early evening, everyone. I'm, as Paige said, Devon Lev. I work with, or work for, excuse me, Public Health of Seattle in Kings County. And my job is um, pretty neat. I am the broom activation manager for the entire county. And it's a big job that it allows me to do some really neat things like being here with you tonight and just to continue to promote um, efforts for preparing all of our children for success. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that tool. I have placed some handouts on the table as well as some examples of, um, of the tool and I'll explain that as we go along. All right, show of hands before we get started. Has anyone heard of the one lady? All right, well, this is great. So, um, I'm going to tell you guys what it is, let you know a little bit about the resources, and then give you some understanding of the science that goes behind the creation of the tool. And then tell you ways that you might like to use it and use it in your own community in the work that you all So, what is wrong? It's a national early learning initiative that was created by the Bezos Family Foundation. Now Bezos is Amazon. We've all heard of Amazon, right? They have a family foundation and um, they have actually taken into consideration the needs of parents in the community and decided that they really wanted to put something together that would help um, prepare them for living with all of the demanding challenges of being new parents, multiple parents, or parents of multiple children, and just being in daily life. And so they have created this tool, this resource, and initiatives that um, pairs activities with early learning and brain science. 
And um, what's really neat about it is that it can be used anywhere you go. It really takes in what's in the environment around you. So there's nothing that people have to buy. You don't really need anything extra in order to do it. Just the ability to want to interact and engage. Um, Basil's Family Foundation is actually located here mm -hmm. in um, King County. They're in downtown Seattle, not far from my office, as a matter of fact. And they paired with us in order to do some activation of this work. See here, there's a map on um, the screen. And the map actually highlights places around the nation that are also doing room activation. So it's a pretty big effort. I'm hoping it'll go nationwide and eventually worldwide. But that's um, work to be done and really will be done with all of the work that we're trying to do. So there's some key principles in the room. Um, they really wanted to, in the behavior, really wanted to get some input from leaders and um, people who were in the field of neuroscience and child development and behavioral economics. And most importantly, in my opinion, feedback from the parents. And so they did a lot of listening and had a lot of dialogues, did a lot of surveys and evaluations, and really came up with these six key principles for how to effectively reach and um, um, reach target audiences in work with parents and caregivers of children ages zero to five. So they really wanted to um, engage with parents and make sure that the messaging was positive and not corrective. So withholding judgment was really important. They wanted to be able to speak in the voice of peers, so taking into account the realities of parents' lives and deliver messages in a tone similar to that that they are already getting messages. Um, aiming for more and better rather than most and best. So making sure that parents know that they can do this. They're already doing this and what a great job that they're doing. Meeting parents where they are. So just making sure that it's accessible. You know, I, I said earlier, room can be done anywhere. You don't have to go to a certain place. You don't have to really have special things. It's just making sure that you understand you can do room anywhere. And then um, celebrating the identities that parents embrace, whether they're teen moms or single dads or um, people of color, just anyone can really, really take a hold of room and, and incorporate it and modify it and adapt it so that it works for them. And then not being afraid to talk about the science is really important. We wanted parents to really understand the science behind brain development, that it's important to engage in these activities, and this is why. And that while it might seem menial or something that is something that you do every day, it's really important because it, it develops that foundation for brain science. I'm sorry, I was going a little fast, and I know there's an interpreter in the room.
my work actually builds upon that work that was initially done in 2014 and allows me to actually go back and reach out to those organizations and beyond and try to get them to engage with the tool in an interactive way. So rather than just having stuff in your hands, really using it and seeing its benefits. So that's why I'm here today to talk to you so that you guys will understand what it is and perhaps can take it on and utilize it as you best need it. So we know a lot about infant brain development. We know that um, at birth, babies are just like sponges. They take in everything. They're primed for connection. So this is when the opportunity is best for us. When babies are born, they can make up to 700 neural connections per second. That's a lot of activity that's going on in their brain. And it really happens based on very simple things that you do. Things that people may think are non-significant are really making an impact. And we'll talk about some of those ways that that's done. So this is both an opportunity and a vulnerability because when we don't take advantage of the opportunity to reinforce these connections, to make those connections happen, then there's the chance that the babies just won't attach and won't um, have the best opportunity for success like we have. This is just a slide that sort of shows how brain development starts out, where it's highest in the different levels around sensory pathways, language, and then higher cognitive function. So we see that there's really heightened um, levels of development according to years, months, and years of birth. And attachment is really important. It's very, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were interpreting too. And attachment is really important for brain development as well. So making sure that babies have that human one-to-one -one connection is what's really important and powerful about this tool. So how does Brain Broom, excuse me, Broom, use this science? Well, they paired with the University of Washington's Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences. There's a lab on the U's campus that has this machine. I think it's one of three in the world. It's, um, they call it MEG. I don't know what the initials stand for, but MEG is this really awesome machine that you can set a baby in, connect adapters to their head, and see the connections forming in their brains based on activities that you do. So with that, the University of Washington was able to do a lot of research about neuroscience and paired with the Basils Family Foundation to develop this tool so that it had specific scientific research behind it. And those three of those key principles were around forming positive adult-child relationships. So like I said, Attachment is very important and strong. Um, strongest when you make sure that it's a concerted effort. Back and forth interactions. So not always leading the opportunity, but allowing the child to lead so that you can take their cues and then they can follow yours as well. And then executive function life skills, which are skills that focus on our focus, our cognitive abilities, are working memories. And I usually do an activity that sort of challenges that, but I won't do that. Um, but just think about things that you learned when you were younger that you remember to this day because you learned them at such a young age. For instance, when I was younger, I learned how to sing a song 
head, shoulders, knees, and toes. And I've tried doing that backwards. It's a challenge if you think about it. <laughs> With your working memory, that's a challenge. And it really um, shows how those executive function life skills are so important to the way that we operate. We go on memory, and then when we challenge that, we have to adapt. And that's what executive function allows us to do. This is a flyer that I actually have placed on the table. It's the five brain building basics. So five key activities that are important for interaction. And it's double-sided in Spanish as well. So just five simple things that parents can be aware of and can do with their children every every day <coughs> to support those three scientific principles that I just Now, I've been talking all about the science and what work I'm doing and really haven't given you an idea of what room is. So, this is an example of what room is. His hair, her hair. This is an activity for doing your child's hair. But what you'll notice is that when you do this activity and you talk about what you're doing and what your child's hair looks like, you'll see that your child is developing skills in vocabulary and math. And that seems like a stretch, but it actually is what's really going on. They're learning how to group things. They're learning to pay attention to what's around them and to use their memory. And that's what's really key about that. Paige mentioned this. Another way that you can get room activity is by using the app. So, room is available for free on your smartphone, either an Android, an iPhone, or a Kindle Fire device. You can download it for free, put in your child's name and birth date, and it will deliver an activity to you every day. And if you want more activities, you can pick your own based on where you are. And the activities are just as simple, as easy to do as the one that I showed you. You'll also notice that on the table around you, there's other activities as well. Feel free to take a look at them. But they're all separated according to age and really fit the need for that child's age. Now, those might seem like a barrier. I'm asking you to go to a smartphone, you know. Room is also available on a website where everything can be downloaded for free as well. You'll have access to all of the activities. There's over a thousand in the library. So think about how much people can be helping to fill these brains if they were to utilize this tool. There's posters. There's videos. I'm going to show a short one, hopefully, at the end of this. You'll just get the sense of the power. I mentioned that room is also available in Spanish. It will soon be available in Chinese, Russian, and Vietnamese. And then there's going to be some work done to get it translated into other languages because I'm very aware that Seattle has over 170 plus spoken languages. And we're looking at getting it translated into more visual ideas so that it won't be as much of a barrier to our community. So just a couple of examples. And I don't expect you guys to read all of this. I'll just tell you what it says. A couple of examples. Um, my organization actually has a nurse family partnership. It's a program that pairs public health nurses with um, new mothers. So it has to be a first time mom. And they get the services of a public health nurse for two years. 
And within that time frame, there's a series of visits. What the nurses have done in that program is started to integrate the usage of room so that parents, especially new parents, will find out ways that they can work on development with their children. And I think it's pretty neat. Um, yes. All of King County. Um, another way that the Nurse Family Partnership is utilizing the tool is through child development, the ASQ3 um, screening tool that's used to see where a child lies in development once they meet with a client whose child is at or just below a cutoff, then they really start to focus on ways that they can enhance the development of that child in their room with the ability to do that. <coughs> the Puget Sound Education Service District, they have an early learning policy council, some of you may be aware of it, and that's a council of about 50 low-income parents who meet monthly <coughs> and talk about things that need to be um, informed about around policy decisions and advocacy priorities related to early learning. What they said is that room offers a great way for parents to interact with their children and to teach parenting skills. Odessa Brown's Children's Clinic is probably one of my favorite case studies and case examples of how this work plays out. So it's a medical clinic. It's located in central Seattle, but reaches a wide and varied um, population. I actually went there as a child, so it's one of my favorite places. <laughs> and, um, what the pediatricians have done is they've posted room information in all of their exam rooms so that parents will have access to the information when they're waiting, and then the pediatrician can talk to them about the science so that it doesn't create any questions that all of their needs are met at that time, and they're continuing to promote child development. They also have posters throughout their clinic and applaud parents when they do brain building activities while they're in the facility. And then I think lastly, um, my organization also has another, we have several nursing programs. <laughs> another nursing program we have is called Promoting First Relationships. So really focusing on attachment and um, making sure that parents are prepared to be parents and supporting them with all types of resources. This particular program is um, shortened from the Nurse Family Partnership one. NFP is two years, PFR is 10 weeks. And what they've done is decided to integrate room as a sort of graduation gift so that parents will feel like they have the resources that they need in order to continue on building these positive, strong relationships with their children. So, I just wanna say that we're all brain builders. We all have what it takes. I can't tell you how many times I'm in a grocery store and I see a baby or a toddler or a teenager and I try to interact with them in some sort of way just to showcase those positive adult-child relationships and to continue promoting the message of child development and brain science and how it impacts our early learning. I think I'm gonna try. Paige, do we have sound? Well, I don't know. We'll try. <laughs> we'll see if we have sound. Are still learning how to use this? We do. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we do. <laughs> okay. I'm really rushing all the time. I don't have enough time to just to sit down with them. Being a full-time mom and having a full-time job, it's not easy. I always worry. Am I doing enough for my kids? Am I doing the important stuff that they need?
is very powerful. Thank you. <laughs> you already have all that takes. Maybe I just didn't look at it that way because I always want better. Oh. Do you put your feet in there? No. No? He knows that I can do it. Which one is rough? This way. It's amazing the little things that we do, we don't even realize we're teaching our kids. We're teaching Yeah. You don't really think of brain development at that young of an age, you know, when you're three months old. Irish step dancing, we wear kilts. We are seen dancing over the sword, that's us. Um, and then I went back to school to become an educator. And starting in 1990, I've been teaching elementary school 
I started with the very primary grades because we, that means you in the room, and me, we're the foundation of how kids learn and grow. And that's why I love this grade level. I'm actually qualified to teach at university, but I prefer teaching at the elementary grades. So what we're going to do tonight is have fun with science. And I have a presentation. I'm not gonna read everything to you because what I really want to spend time on are the centers. Before I actually start the presentation, I would like to just make one request. I know some people think science is messy and icky and ooh, like when it comes to worms or soil, we have none of that here. But I hope you will all participate. The messiest center is the one by the back window. But I did bring a bucket of warm soapy water and some towels so you can immediately wash your hands. The center that's over here are discovery bottles. You will be building your own. You'll pick up a bottle. There's all sorts of stuff. You'll want one from every container. Then you will need to fill the rest of the bottle using the funnel with some rice. The bottle should be about this full when you're done. I have two samples here to show other things you can do with them. This has animals, little plastic animals in it. And this one has all sorts of different buttons. And the buttons are all different shapes, animals, small things. And I actually tried this with one of the secretaries in my area, and I told her she loves Scotty dogs. And I said, there's a Scotty dog in here. So she sat like this. <laughs> 10 minutes looking for the Scotty dog. It really is in here. The ones you're building are about magnetism. So after you build your bottle, please make sure you also take a magnetic wand so that when you go back to your daycare providing area, go back to the kids, you can actually have them play with it. This, I bought everything the store had, so I can tell you there are only 36. But I did bring some, there are some magnets in here. So if these run out, there are magnets in here, and then I'm hoping maybe Paige, we can do something about, because I bought everything they had. So if there's a way maybe we could find ones for them. Um, but in the meantime, I do have these magnets. And we'll just figure out a way. Okay? The table here may seem boring to some, but it's all about rocks. And you're probably going to notice I love rocks. Um, again, you'll look at a book, you'll sort rocks, you'll talk about, uh, it's here, you'll talk about words. What are the words you can use to describe rocks? And I'm actually going to read you a story first. But when you've done the activity, please make sure you take a bag of rocks with you so that you have, again, some materials to do this activity. So, that being said, <laughs> I've already introduced myself, but I did want to say there are three people who really helped me out. They're not here tonight. But Kathy Bitko got all of the bottles we're using from Pepsi. Pepsi Company donated all the bottles for us. Amy Spees helped get some of the materials for me. And then Samantha put together all the resource packets that you have at your table. So in the early years, there really are standards. I'm going to show you the standards, but I will tell you the most important one is being curious and asking questions. Let kids ask questions. I'm going to adult children. 
Um, my son's 27, and my daughter's 32. So they are obviously grown. But as children, it was constantly, why, why, why? Why does a match curl? Why did we get mold on the grapefruit? Why is Kool-Aid purple? And they ask questions all the time. I let them discover the answers. I didn't tell them. What I'm going to show you is what Head Start says. The only one you need to focus on right now is the one in bold. It says science, knowledge, and skills. These are all the areas that Head Start covers. I'm only going to talk about science. <laughs> Two things. Scientific skills, and it does say method, but is method is your choice. How you want to do something is the method. And then knowledge of the natural and physical world. And we're going to be dealing with both of those things today. Again, kids want to know about their world. If we just let them play and be curious, they really want to know. They will ask questions. And it's okay to say, I don't know. Let them explore. And science is one of the best ways for students to gain literacy. When we're talking about scientific skills, one important thing is using the senses, our eyes, our nose, our ears, preferably not our mouth, no tasting, and our hands. I know it's, a, it's far for you to see, but I did put some sentence frames up. So if it helps you with when you're questioning, how does the, whatever, walk, goofy stuff, the floor, anything. How does that feel? Then the student can say, the rock feels, and they describe it. How does the rock look? The rock looks, and again, they explain it. We're not looking for sciencey words. If you look at the chart at the back in blue, you're going to be talking about clouds. You'll notice it doesn't say stratus, alto stratus, cumulonimbus. It says puppy, wispy, blanket, cotton, fluffy. That's how kids describe clouds, and that's OK. Because you know what? That's actually how scientists would also describe them before they put the real name to it. The book I have on clouds, the one that says, do you know clouds have names, is available free as a download. Um, I have the website listed at the bottom, but I will also tell you a much easier way to find it. But it is absolutely free. Oh, thank you. You'll notice, again, they observe. That just simply means they look. They describe, which just simply means they talk, and they discuss. That means two people are having a conversation, preferably two children or the child talking to you, not you talking to the child, and there really is a difference. Kids start life being curious, and I'll be honest, ends that curiosity. I've seen it time and time again. My daughter was five and she asked questions about fire. The teacher said, fire starts with matches. She said, but I thought you could use a magnifying glass. And the teacher said, no, fire starts with matches. My daughter wouldn't let it go. But my daddy says, you can hold the magnifying glass just right so the sun hits it, and we can start a fire when we camp. 
And the teacher told her, no, the fire starts with matches. Talk about killing a kid's curiosity. That's kinder, by the way, <coughs> kindergarten. So let your kids do all sorts of things, whether it's your personal children or the children you watch. <coughs> Stuff in an aquarium, blowing bubbles, making shadows, sinking and floating. It doesn't take a lot of stuff. Most of the stuff that I have for your bottles, I just walked around actually my sewing drawer and looked to see what I had. The most important thing are the two bottom ones. Children learn to speak through science. I currently work with fifth graders and many of the fifth graders are not English speakers. They all took the science test today. I just got a message from the teachers and they said it looked like they just looked for all the science words because they knew those and they could find the question and the answer by using the science words. So we're really looking for something powerful from them. The other thing, and I know I've repeated myself, but doing science is how many children will develop literacy and academic vocabulary. Um, the middle one is that kids typically, and I'm going by the fifth graders I work with, they want to do science all day, every day. Little children, given the chance, would actually do this also. One thing that's really lacking in school right now is that outdoor play. Kids aren't getting enough time outside. If we just let our kids go outside, they would get that chance. Science just begins in childhood. There are three major components, the content, processes, and attitude. So content is really not, like at this age, it's not about learning all the right terms. It's about exploring and having fun and being curious. Processes, this is important. And you're saying, so what processes? I, turn, I put a paper on your table and it says science and engineering practices. It looks like this. And if anyone is missing it, we'll see what we can do about getting them or... But this is what it is. These are the science process skills. However, there's eight, but these are the ones you need to look at. Have kids ask questions. If you notice what I said, lots and lots of questions. Constructing explanations, that just means let them talk about what they saw or what they learned. These are learning language. Communicating information. Again, let them talk. I don't know how many of you have children in public school, and I observed this. Kids get to school and they go to get breakfast and they're told, be quiet, don't talk, we're eating now. And they get in line and they have to walk quietly. And then they sit down and they must sit down quietly. And then the teacher says, okay, so who's going to answer? Well, who wants to answer? They've been told, don't talk, don't talk, don't talk. And we have to start letting kids talk. And the last one's attitude. It's showing you, showing curiosity about the world too. You are the most powerful influence on the children. And I put something up here. Even if you think something, and I said worms or soil or slimy things, even if you think they're icky or nasty, please try not showing it. Because I notice most of us are female in here. And if we go, ew, I'm not touching that, what do you think the girls will do? Ew, I'm not touching that. Yes. So, if you really don't like touching some things, and I had to teach teachers about this, I said, well, then this is what you do. I'm going to model. I noticed you're being so responsible today. I'm so proud of that. <coughs> These are the worms we're going to use. Do you 
you think you can handle them gently? Usually they'll say, yes, I can do that. <laughs> Would you please hand out one worm to every student? Now you don't have to touch one. <laughs> it works. It works. And you never showed, I never once showed that I didn't like them. I didn't go, um, can you do this? Because, you know, not me. Um, yeah. So there are ways to get around things that you don't necessarily want to do. Just try not to let it show. Okay. So curiosity, discovery, and explanation, uh, exploration, we're going to start. I'm hoping everybody got a science notebook. I need 40. So I hope you all have one. This is, this is, you need this. Okay? And I hope a pencil. Because I want you to do. Another notebook for these. Yeah. Kind of what we would expect children to do as they get older. You will use some words. Children at three and four aren't going to do too many words, but they can draw. And if you give them the letters as they are learning letters, it may look like scribbles, but they can still draw their observations. And they can tell you what they drew and then you can write that down in their book for them. But I will tell you, giving students, even small students, a science notebook, it helps them take science more seriously. Now, before we get going, I am going to read a story. Because at the rock table it says, read the story. But that would mean that every group would need to hear it. So instead, I'm going to read the story to you. I timed it. It takes about four minutes. The story is called, Everybody Needs a Rock. Everybody needs a rock. I'm sorry for kids who don't have a rock for a friend. I'm sorry for kids who only have tricycles, bicycles, horses, elephants, fire engines, and things like that if they don't have a rock for a friend. That's why I'm giving you 10 rules for choosing a rock. Not just any rock, I mean a special rock that you find for yourself, maybe forever. If someone says, what's special about that rock? Don't tell them, ever. I don't. Nobody is supposed to know what's special about another person's rock. All right, here's the rules. Number one, if you can, go to a mountain made of nothing but a hundred million small, shiny, beautiful, roundish rocks. But if you can't, any place will do. An alley, even a sandy road. When you're looking for a rock, don't let mothers or fathers or sisters or brothers or even best friends talk to you. You should choose a rock when it's quiet. Don't let dogs bark at you. Don't let bees buzz at you. But if they do, don't worry. There's nothing worse than looking for a rock when you're worried. Rule number three, bend over. No, more. More. You, you might even have to put your head on the ground. <laughs> You have to look a rock right in the eye. Otherwise, don't blame me if you can't find one. Rule number four, don't get a rock that's too big. You'll be sorry. It won't fit in your hand. It won't feel right. It won't fit in your pocket. A rock as big as an apple is too big. A rock as big as a horse is much too big. Rule number five, don't 
don't choose a rock that's too small, it'll be easy to lose. Or a mouse will take it, thinking it's a seed. Believe me, it already happened to a boy. Number six, the size must be perfect. It has to feel good in your hand when you close your fingers over it. It has to feel jumpy in your pocket when you run. Some people touch their rocks a thousand times a day. Rule number seven, look for the perfect color. It could be pinkish gray with bits of silvery in it. Some rocks look brown and you only see the color right if you squint. Or if you dip the rock in water, you can see the color. Number eight. The shape of the rock is up to you. Some people only like flat rocks. Don't ask me why. Things to remember about a rock is this. Any rock can look good with a hundred other rocks. But if your rock's going to be special, it has to be good by itself in your hand. Rule number nine. Always <coughs> sniff the rock. Rocks have a smell. Some kids can tell by sniffing a rock whether it came from the middle of the earth or from the ocean or from a mountain. You'll find that grown-ups can't smell rocks. <coughs> Too bad for them. They just can't smell as well as kids. Don't ask anybody to help you choose. I have seen a lizard pick one rock in a desert out of all the rocks in the desert. I've seen a snail pass up 20 rocks and spend all day getting to the one it wanted. You have to make up your mind. You'll know. All right, that's the 10 rules. If you think of any more, write them down. I'm going out to play a game. And that just takes me and one rock to play. And I just happen to have my rock right here. <laughs>